Thank you, worship team. Thank you, church. God is good. And all the time. Hmm. Y'all ready? One person. Well, that excites me. Okay. So, I give you a warning. This message, this message should crush you. I need you to hear me. Stop talking. Listen real quickly. Then you can go back to your talking. This message right now should crush you. So I need you to get ready. Like, if you got things you need to do between now and the next 30 minutes, like go ahead and do them. And then let's lean into what God's going to say to us. Because this message should crush you. Are you ready? You don't need to look at anybody else. Look, close your eyes if you have to. Don't fall asleep and just look at God. Because I'm telling you, this is what all of us need to walk with every single day. I have had to walk with this all week, a couple weeks now, and it has destroyed me. <laughs> because there's a standard that has been set by God. There's a standard. When I was in college, I played soccer. And there was a standard if you wanted to make the team. There was a standard if you wanted to start. I remember working really hard in the preseason so that I could start my sophomore year, my junior year, my senior year. We had to run a mile in under six. We had to run three miles in like, I don't know, 24, 20, 23, I don't know, some crazy number, 21. Um, but we had to do that. That's the first part, and they were back-to-back, -back, by the way. So you ran the first mile, and then you ran the next three miles, and you had to beat the time. Then you had to juggle 100 times um, without the ball hitting the ground. So, like, there was a standard. There was more things. You had, you had to run to the 40 in certain things. But we had a standard. Tyler's a coach. Tyler, there's some standards. Hey, if you want to play sports in high school, middle school, there's standards, right? And you have standards at your job, right? There's a standard that God has set that God has laid before you. So right now, I want you to hear this sermon and see if you live up to the standard. We good? Everybody understand where we're going here? Psalm 15. Psalm 15. We're in a, a series and we're almost through it called Summer in the Psalms because summer's almost over. And, and so we're in Psalm 15 today. In fact, next week's the last message in Psalms. Context is... David writes this psalm, and there's a good possibility, not 100%, but we're pretty sure that David is taking the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant represents God, his presence. He's taking it back, returning it to Jerusalem. He places it in the tent, Mount Zion. So we're talking about carrying the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, into his holy place. And listen to the question that David asks in Psalm 15, verse 1. He says this, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? Now, we don't talk like this, so let me translate for you. Who has the right to be in the presence of God? When you come into this place, and we're intent about meeting with God, it's not an event we do. We have come here to worship God we worship Him in music, we worship Him in giving, we worship Him in our attitudes, in the things that we think, in the way that we listen, in the way that we encourage, the way we lay ourselves down, our posture. This is how we are to worship God. Who has the right to do that? Who is okay with God? You ever wonder that? Am I okay with God? Is God disappointed in me? I, I got a whole sermon on that. It is so good. But, but listen, who, who, who do you have to be? What is the standard? So you're not going to be confused after this message. Here's how he starts out. Here's the first answer. He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. So let's just leave that verse up there. Inventory. Check it out. 
do you walk blamelessly? Just, just, just think about it. He mentions walking blamelessly before you ever speak. See, we're really good at telling people what we believe. We're really good at talking about Jesus. We're really good at declaring that we love God, that we're saved, that we've been baptized. But in order to be right with God, your walk better match your talk. Your walk has to, become, has to come before your talk. Don't tell me you love Jesus. Show me. Don't tell me you love him and his bride, the church. Show me. This is what God is saying. You have to walk blamelessly. How we walk reveals more than how we talk. Some of us need to shut up. I say that out of love. Seriously, I don't like that word, but I say, some of us need to close our mouth. We talk too much. And you know why I say that? Because the things you talk about are you. <laughs> the things you post about are you, your family, your job, your memories. Oh, Facebook memories, they're great, aren't they? How much, do you, how much do you talk about the Lord? How much do you post about God? How much do you think about God? How much time do you spend with God? In order to be right with God, we have to walk blameless. You know that word blameless? Hebrew word, to be morally perfect. Have moral integrity and wholeness. Is that you? Are you morally perfect? Are you doing everything right? Go back to that verse. Are you doing everything right? He does what is right. Everything. I'm talking about everything. If you have a hard time identifying where your sin is, you're not doing anything right. <laughs> you got pride that has blinded you. Religion that has blinded you. You've got, you've got to do a self-care analysis here. And speaks truth in his heart, do you know that your heart is always talking to you? Right now, you're making, your heart is saying something to you. You make judgments and decisions. It never stops talking to you. The question is, is what is it saying? Is it truth or is it not? When the Bible talks about heart, it's talking about our core, who we are. Why you do what you do. Why you talk the way you talk. Why you think the way, why you spend money the way you do. Why you, why you treat your family the way you do. See, you know what our default says? It's the way I grew up. It's what I've seen. It's what's been modeled for me. It's how I know. It's all I've ever done. That's all hiding what the problem is. It's your heart. You Think about your struggles, your sin. It's coming from your heart. It's your heart. Who, I say this a lot, who's on the throne of your heart? It's one of two people. It's the Lord or it's you. How do I know? Who controls your life? That's it. That is it. Just get real right now. Who makes your decisions? Who makes your decisions? We don't, and we, we can't control the Holy Spirit, so don't, infer what I'm saying or, or take this the wrong way, but we don't spend enough time processing, praying in order to allow the Holy Spirit to move and speak. We make decisions on the fly. We make decisions so hurried. You know why? Because we're in control. Who is on the throne of your heart? And this is hard for me, y'all, because I had to walk with this all week and I recognize that I love Jesus, I'm a pastor, I'm a follower of Christ, I'm saved, I've been baptized, I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, doing, I'm doing a lot of good things for the Lord, but this week, there were battles in my heart. There's battles going on. Right? I mean, when things don't go my way, I get mad. I get, I get annoyed. Sometimes, my first response comes out, and it's not always great. Now, you can ask some staff members, some church members who know me. Sometimes I say things that I shouldn't. Sometimes, I, some, sometimes I'll get so frustrated with sin, and it's other people's sin that I'm aware of, and I'll start, 
I'll start talking to people about them, not in a mean way, but maybe just sharing my heart. And it's wrong. It's just wrong. There's times when I think my way is the best way. I have heart issues. What about you? You don't cuss because you're in construction. Well, I mean, Chris, you don't know. Everybody around me is doing it. Okay. Okay. You got a heart issue. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm not saying you don't love Jesus. But you have a heart issue. It's because your heart is evil. You don't blow up at your spouse when they didn't put the dishes away again or forgot their kid again. Confession. <laughs> I, I, I forget Lily sometimes. She's not in here. So don't tell her. She already knows. But You don't blow up at your spouse or your kids who are driving you bonkers because they're driving you bonkers or because you've had a long day. It's because you have a heart issue. Me too. You don't, you don't talk about people in the church. Because they're all wrong and you're right. It's a heart issue. Can we just get honest? We're already below the standard that God has set. Oh, but don't worry. David wants to push us a little more. Verse 3. God's standard. Who does not slander with his tongue? Does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. If your heart is ruled by God, just leave that verse up there. If your heart is ruled by God, if you're meeting God's standard, if, if, if God is okay with you, then you're not doing these things in verse 3. You'll never speak evil against another person. Ever. You know that person who hurt you? That person. That person. Don't think about everybody else. Well, for the most part, I'm good. No, 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 no. God's standard is never. Never. No act of selfishness, no moment of impatience or irritation, no lashing out with unkind words, no pushing myself to the center of attention, no closing my eyes to the need of another because I don't have time for them. This is what that verse says. No room for being offended. Never, it says, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. We can't do that. Do you know what that means? That, that means that word reproach, it, it literally means this, to strip. In other words, I'll never do anything or I'll never say anything to or about another person that would strip them of their reputation. In other words, here it is. Don't, don't elbow somebody, but if you're sitting beside them, you know, you can smile. Nobody, no, I'm just kidding, but don't, listen. In other words, that verse means don't gossip. Now see what you did in your mind right then? You either said, oh, that's me, or oh, I, don't, I ain't got to worry about that. that. That's what you just did. And see, some of you are really good at gossiping. You all could point them out right now. See, you don't even know you're a gossiper. If you want to know, ask your closest friends. Seriously, just ask them. If you don't have any friends, that might be an indication. <laughs> right? But seriously... Gossip hurts. It hurts. There is Your tongue has the power of life and death, James says. That means what you say to people or what you say about people can encourage them, can build them up, 
can edify them, can push them into greatness, can draw them closer to God. But the same is true when you talk junk about them, when you lie about them, or you tell the truth about them. And it doesn't have to be to them, it can be about them, right? And I say this all the time, because the pushback is, well, Chris, I'm just telling the truth. Well, that's great. Mandy and I talk about this. I'm going to put it on the screen. It's been a point before, but we need to drive this home, especially if you're a teenager or a young adult who loves to say whatever they feel. Everything that you say should be true, but not everything true should be said. You understand what I mean by that? Whatever comes out of your mouth should be true. But just because it's true doesn't give you the authority or the right to say it. So if I know that my brother is struggling in their marriage, I don't need to go to somebody else and say, hey, Bob is really struggling in his marriage. It's true what I'm saying, but that's not building up Bob. That's not helping their marriage. Everything that comes out of your mouth better be true. But, but you don't have to speak it if it is. We do a lot of damage that way. Now, for those of you who say, I don't gossip, okay, let me ask you this. Do you enjoy listening to gossip? Are you the person that everybody goes to? Well, Chris, I don't know. It just finds me. I don't, I don't, I'm just sitting here on Sunday. Somebody sits right beside me and starts telling me about Sister Clarice and what she, we don't have a Clarice, so that's why I use that name, right? So I have an Aunt Clarice, but okay. We won't go there. So, can I remind you that gossip is not just what you say? Did you know this? It's what you post. It's what you pray about. It's what you text or slide up in DMs. And it's also, listen, what you listen to. Proverbs 17.4 says it this way. Wrongdoers eagerly listen to gossip. Wrongdoers easily listen to gossip. Liars pay close attention to slander. In other words, listen. What you permit, you promote. The Bible says that you are wrong if you listen to gossip. Some of us just love the juiciness. It's wrong. It's wrong. So according to God's standard, right, we got to be perfect. we got to walk morally perfect. We can't do any harm. We can't, our hearts got to be true. We can't speak ill against people that we love. And, we de- and, and, and the people who've hurt us, we've got to love and, and go after them with Christ's love. And we can't speak any gossip. And we can't listen to it or post it. How we doing, church? It it, it gets real good. Let's go. Verse 4. In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. What does this mean? What does this verse mean? This person is so connected to God, loves his word so much, that he is revolted, Turned off and turned away by sin. This person hates sin as much as God does. Sin is not attractive to him. And let me be honest with you, sin is sexy. It is. You know. Don't you know this? Like, think about the sin in your life. Why do you do the things you do? Because right? you're attracted to it. Because sin looks to be the source of what you need. So we, so we run to the sin instead of to the Savior. Because we think the sin will bring us joy, satisfaction, happiness. So we'll think about sin. We'll commit sin. And, and I get it. In the church, it's not 
a lot of times it's not the big sin. Although I'm finding out there's a lot of secret sin in the church. I'm not just talking about vision. I'm talking about Christians. There is secret sin. There are men who are sleeping around. There are women who are sleeping around. Before marriage, during marriage, and not with their wife, not with their husband. Look around. People in here, probably addicted to pornography, alcohol, drugs. See, those are the kind of what we think is big sins, right? We're blinded by the pride we have. Because we're thinking about all the other people. While I'm talking about those, you're thinking about the people in the church. You're not even looking at yourself with the sin that you have. Our tongues are too loose. Our hurt is too much and we haven't forgiven. These are sins. And, and let's, let's be honest, we secretly like it. Feels good for a season. Sin takes you further than you ever want to go. Let me tell you. I'm going to tell you how to take an inventory last week of what you did. What did you feed yourself with? Think about it. Now, some of us fed a lot of food and we were gluttons. That's sin. We overate. That's a huge problem in America. Churches don't talk about it. But food is an idol. But I, I, I'll push that one to the side. What did you feed yourself with this week? What did you listen to in the car? What did you look at on social media? Think about your conversations. Think about the temptations that you have. Think about the flirting you did. You're married, but it wasn't with your spouse. It was with someone else. How you spent your time, were you lazy at all? Did you prioritize God and his word? It's hard, isn't it? Let's, come on, let's get real. Take a breath. We're okay. I'm guilty of all of this. All of this. Because it's hard. Evil is everywhere. And we should not. Please, please. Please, please stop putting your hope that this world is going to get better. Stop. If your hope is a new president, if your hope is new gas prices, if your hope is a new school or a new job or a new relationship, stop. You are hopeless. Your hope has to be in Jesus. I mean, it has to be. And look. This is why I say this, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. I'm not sure if it's on the screen, but just listen to this. Understand this, church, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Now listen to what people are described as. People will be lovers of self. Who looks out for number one? We're going to be lovers of money. We're going to be proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Hello, come on parents, you should have clapped and shouted, holy hallelujah, right? Disobedient, ungrateful, unholy. Keep going, come on. Heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. You want to know why we don't see more works of God? It's because the people of God are living like this. We just want the Red Sea to part. God's looking for some Moseses. It's so easy to get sucked in by sin. And some of us, we have to get honest right now that we are so far desensitized by sin that we don't even know how to get out. We're numb to it. David says, we've got to hate sin as much as God does. Newsflash, you cannot pursue sin 
and pursue God at the same time. God has all of you, or your sin has all of you. I'm telling you, you cannot actively pursue sin and pursue God at the same time. They do not coexist. David says, the last thing is, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. When this person makes a business transaction, when this person makes a promise, when this person says, I'm going to help you out, when this person makes a deal, even if the deal is not in their favor, even if they realize after making the, the agreement that it's going to hurt them, they stay with it. Because they're a person of integrity. They're a person of their word. They will not take bribe against the innocent. And David concludes and says, He who does these things shall never be moved. So if you want to be okay with God, you have to do all of these things. So here's what I want us to do right now. If you're online, I don't know how you can do this. Maybe Marcy can help you, but maybe not. But if you're in this building, what I'd like for you to do is stand up. Everybody, I'm going to stand up too, okay? Everybody stand up right now. Stand up, stand up. Stretch it out because we'll be sitting down in just a second, okay? All right, stand up, stand up. Okay, so here's what I got. Ready? Ready? If you've reached this standard, if this is you, if that person is you, what I want you to do is remain standing. Go ahead. Remain standing if that is you. So check it out. You can look around. We're all guilty. All of us. We are not okay by God's standard. I'm not saying this. Man, I like you guys. <laughs> According to God, the creator, we don't measure up. And that's why we feel this way. Don't you feel this way? God disappointed you. God, I, I. It's because we don't measure up. We aren't good enough. We can't do it. We can try our best. Seriously. I ask people all the time, why are you going to heaven? If you died, are you going to heaven? They say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. I think so. Okay, well, why? I've, I've tried to be a good person. Number one answer. I've tried to be a good person. I try to take care of others. I, I, I try to live a right life. According to that standard, none of us can do enough. None of us. Do you understand why this message has crushed me? And why you feel, look, some of you are like mad right now. Don't be mad. Me too. Like it's all of us. We don't measure up. So what happens is we live this life the best we can. Some of us trust in God and we still try ourselves to get right with God. But in the end, we don't meet the standard. It's impossible. Now what's crazy is that Psalm 15 is meant to be, it's called the Psalm of Comfort. Do you guys feel comforted? Welcome to Vision. How in the world can this be the Psalm? Maybe I, maybe I read it wrong on my iPad. Maybe that's what the problem is. Let's see. Let me go here. Psalm. Okay, Psalm 15. And let's see, almost there. Yeah, yeah. Walks blameless, does it right, speaks. It's the same. It's not that. How can this psalm comfort me? Because I'm crushed. Write this down. The gospel. Listen to me. This is where I really need you to kind of like zone in. The gospel has to crush you before it can comfort you. Stay focused. Reality is, we don't measure up. Take a breath. Stop trying so hard. You will fail. So God, listen, listen, listen. God, in his great love for you, 
Don't look at your situation in your life because some of you are angry. You're angry at church. You're angry at preachers. You're angry at God. You're angry at situations that have happened. Listen, God in his wisdom and his love, he loved you so much that he saw Psalm 15 and knew that you can't do it. But he loves you so much that he wants you to be with him. He wants to bless you. He wants to give you an abundant, full life. But we are sinners. We got bad theology. Some of us think we sin. Stop. We are sinners. Some of us have never said that. I'm a sinner. I am a sinner. You are a sinner. And I say that out of love, not judgment. According to God's standard, we don't meet it. We will always fail and we will always fall. Think about the sin in your life. Think about what you love more than God. Think about the things that you do on the weekend or the things that you have to get away from and what you do to get away or the way you treat people. Are you selfish? Think about this. This is us. We are sinners. It's not that we sin. We are sin. Our heart is deceitfully wicked. Now listen. Sin is not just what we do. It's who we are. In our best moments, we fall short. The Bible says because of that truth, because of that reality, by your admission, you all sat, by, by your admission, you must die. You want to know why people die? You ever wonder that? Sin. Sin. Maybe not their sin particular, but it's sin. We're all sinners. This is the reason people die. It's the reason you've lost loved ones, that you're, you have a time on this earth, you will die. Now how in the world can Psalm 15 comfort me? Because I feel like trash. What if I told you that Psalm 15 was pointing to someone else? What if I told you that Psalm 15 was really David prophesying about Jesus? Think about Jesus. Did he walk blameless? Think about Jesus. Did he speak truth? Think about Jesus. Was he perfect? Think about Jesus. Did he love others? Did he ever speak one ill thing about anyone else? You think about Jesus. He didn't even take a bribe. Remember early on in his ministry? Tempted by the enemy, by Satan himself. The enemy says, you can have everything you want. Did Jesus take the bribe? Absolutely not. The point is, Jesus, Jesus experienced everything that you feel and that you're going through today. But he met the standard. And this psalm is meant to remind us that on our best days, we're still bad sinners. And we need Jesus. This psalm tells us that our best works will not get us to heaven. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5 says, For our sake God made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You are only ever okay if you have confessed your sin and abandoned your righteousness. This is the comfort. That even though you're a hot mess like me, Christ has satisfied the debt that you owe. It's a gift. And so you don't have to live in condemnation anymore. That's what Paul says in Romans. There's no guilt. There's no condemnation. Some of you are trying so hard. You think, is God proud of me? Is God pleased with you? It's not about you. I'm glad you're doing all of those things for Christ. I'm glad the Holy Spirit is filling you. But look, stop. Stop trying so hard. Allow the Lord to lead you. He's pleased with you because of His Son. His Son meets the standard. And if you're walking and living your life apart from Christ, you are guilty. But the comfort is for those who have trusted in Christ that we are free. We are innocent. And although we struggle with sin, we are saved. That is, that is comforting. 
But before I can ever get to the comfort saying, thank you, Jesus, raising my hands in worship, being excited about being in church, I have to be crushed by my sin. It was my sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. Jesus died in my place as my sin. Every time I lust, every time I speak an untrue thing, every time I, I, I'm prideful, every time I got to have it my way, every time I think I know best, every time I, 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 I parent the wrong way or, or do a husband the wrong way or, or or, or speak to you every time I'm greedy. Every single sin is what nailed my Savior to the cross. Do you understand that? When you get there, when you understand, this should crush you. And that is the moment where you have a choice. You turn to Christ or you turn to sin. Some of you, I get so sick of people saying, I got saved, and there was never a crushing. You can't, you can't get saved unless you're crushed under the weight of your sin. But the comfort is that Christ paid it all. That is good news. But you can't stop with the comfort. Because if you've been comforted, then you'll pursue the call. See, there's a crushing, there's a comforting, but there's a call. I told you about Romans 8 and Paul speaking Verses 1 through 11, and he comforts us. No condemnation. You've been set free. No more guilt. We're, we're unable to live the life, but the Holy Spirit now is in, inside of us, leading us, directing us, giving us power to do and say and believe things that, that we can't do on our own, right? And, and it all is comforting. Praise God. And so we come in here and we celebrate. But we don't stop with the comfort. I believe many Christians are comfortable. That's for another day. But we're resting in our comfort without pursuing our call. Do you know what verse 12 says of Romans 8? It says this. We are debtors. You ever owe somebody something? When you understand what you've been forgiven, when you understand that Christ has paid it all, that you can't meet God's standard, but He can, and that it's a gift given to you, now you're in debt to Him. Not to the flesh, not to the sin struggle. For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your body, you will live. In other words, Paul says you cannot accept the comfort without pursuing the call. Chris, how do I do it? How do I stop sinning? How do I, some of us... We struggle with it. We want to. Our mind says we do, but we can't stop struggle, struggling with sin. How do we do it? How do we live a holy life? Do you know that God calls you to live a holy life? How do you do it in a world that's jacked up? How do you do it around people who are cursing all day and they don't love God? How do you do it when all you see on social media is, is, is just pleasure, 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 fame, 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 greed, greed, greed? Chris, how am I supposed to live a godly life in a jacked up world? Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared. That's, that's a shouting time. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us. Wait, wait, wait. What's training us? The grace of God. The grace of God is training us to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. What is it that teaches you to say no? Is it your parents? What is it that makes you want to love God? What is it that makes you want to do right, to, to, to love the things of God? What makes you excited about gathering? What, what makes you want to be right with God? It's not because you grew up that way. It's not because you're afraid the big man in the sky is going to zap you if you don't or harm your family. Why do you want to live this life? How do you live this life that we call Christianity? It's grace. It is God's glorious grace. God's riches at Christ's expense, right? It's grace. It is the grace of God. And you can't earn it. You can't buy it. There's nothing you can do to have it given to you. It is a free gift of God. And it was given at Christ's expense. You cannot embrace the comfort of the gospel without running after it's called. We are obliged. That's the, that debtors. We are obligated we are obligated to live a holy life, to tell others about Jesus, to be on mission. 
not just in India, not just inside this building, but everywhere, in our job, in our family, in our neighborhood, in, in our social media. We are on mission. So as I wrap this up, I want you to hear me very clearly because I believe that, that there are many people today that needed to hear this message. Some of us have not been crushed before and you're angry. And I'm just telling you, you're not alone. We're all guilty. Some of you are pursuing sin more than you pursue God. You need to fall on your face and repent. I'm saying this out of love because God doesn't want, God doesn't want anything from you. He wants something for you. He wants you to have an abundant life, a full life, all the blessings that he can bestow on you. And you trust him to give it to you. You trust him as you lead. But you've got to be crushed. Now, some of you, some of you are so satisfied in the comfort of God that you've forgotten the call of God. So you say things like, well, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven, so it's okay. How cheap, how cheap do you make grace? when you say things like that. You cannot. Freedom in Christ is not a license to sin. Oh, if, if we could just understand that. When you sin, man, there's a lost world that's watching and being impacted. You've got to let that go. Christianity is not comfortable. You're obligated to a call to live a holy life righteous life by the grace of God and some of you listen I believe there's many of you who are defeated who are discouraged because you're trying to live out the gospel but you're not living in the comfort you're saved and you're trying so hard and you walk around discouraged I didn't read today I didn't do this I'm disappointment I failed again I sinned again and great I'm glad there's conviction there but you've got to rest in the comfort Jesus satisfied what you can't do. So you give that to Christ. You, you repent. And you, you wake up and you say, okay, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live for you today. I'm not going to look back. I'm looking ahead. I just wonder where you are today. I hope this message came across in my intent that it wasn't to hurt you. It wasn't to crush you. But I want you to know that when you feel that crush, there's a comfort. His name is Jesus. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you, friends, I want to take a little bit of time. And I want you not to look around. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand so you don't got nothing to look at. All of you little sneaky people. I want you right now to take an inventory of yourself. Look at your last week. Shoot, look at this morning. When is the last time you were crushed because of your sin? Some of us need to go back to that memory. Shoot, some of us have never been crushed. Now you've realized that you don't meet the standard. And some of you are walking crushed instead of resting in comfort. And today you need to you need to be more mindful of the fact that Jesus has satisfied what you could not do. And then there's some of you who are not living the call. You think being a Christian means coming to church and being in a group and serving. And that's your Christianity and giving and man. What if we're missing people because we're so focused on this building or the, this program 
what if, what if Christianity is less about coming to church and doing all these things, but more about resting in the comfort of Jesus and treating people with the grace that God has treated you with. Sharing the good news. You all know people who are hurting today. So I'm going to pray us into this song. And I just want you to sit there. And I want you to do business with God. And let God speak to you. And listen to the words. Father, your will be done. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we don't just give up hope and feel guilt and condemnation. But you have given us your son. You, we love you because you first loved us. And so I thank you for setting me free today. Holy Spirit, do some work now. Convict. Move us to repentance because of your kindness. I love you, Jesus. Church, let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we thank you so much for this service. We thank you for, thank you for your son. We thank you that he died on the cross for our sins and in our place, Lord. We thank you that you gave us a way to spend eternity with you, Lord. Words just do not measure up to, to our thankfulness, our gratitude, just like we sang earlier, Lord. Words just do not measure up to what you've done for us, Lord. There's a standard that, that you set that we just can't meet, Lord. And you sent your son, Jesus, to accomplish that standard, Father. And I pray each and every person in this room understands that, understands that there, there's nothing that we can do apart from you. There's nothing that we can do without you, Father. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this fellowship, Lord. And we love you. We pray these things in your name. And everybody said, hey, listen, church. In the nicest way possible, I hope you guys were absolutely crushed today. I know that sounds terrible and everything, but and truly, I, I hope that this message from Pastor Chris really touched your heart today. You guys have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to go and love Jesus, love people, and live your purpose. So go out and be the church. We'll see you next week. Love you guys.